With solar power, we can bring internet anywhere. All I need is a clean line of sight to the sky in between mountaintops to be able to relay internet to anywhere in the valley. Currently, we have at least 11 solar pops or point of presences all over town. Previously, before solar power was available, we would have to run generators 24 hours and it was very cost prohibitive because it would require constant maintenance. With solar panels, we can calculate everything to know how many clients that we need to serve in an area and we can bring out that much power to serve that many antennas and radios and facility equipment in order to run power for it. Previously, a lot of people just couldn't get internet access wherever they were, mainly because it was cost prohibitive to bury wires or run overhead lines because you wouldn't be able to get up on a mountaintop and just put up some solar panels to run the power required in order to run the gear to relay internet access to them. Here we are on top of a mountaintop that can see clearly into the valley, but over here, there is, there's absolutely no way to, for me to get a signal over there without going further up into the mountains. And that's prohibitive because of the density required. There's thousands of homes back here. By doing a, a solar relay site, I can get the data up to this site, and then we can relay it down into the homes and businesses and give them reliable internet access. With COVID, we've been able to actually save people from moving and selling their houses. With all the states closed, they've been having to telecommute and work from home. Thanks to these solar sites that we have up here, we've actually been able to save people from moving or selling their houses and be able to stay where they currently are. A lot of these places that people live don't have great reliable internet, especially for their Zoom conferences where the upload is key. Previously, it would have cost tens of thousands of dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to do this from generators, batteries, and all sorts of associated parts to now I can just use something like a park bench and get hundreds of clients on it, such as this site. This location has always been a problem for me because there's always been houses over further out, but those were all big custom homes. Lately, they've been adding thousands of homes right in this area right here, and I haven't been able to get to it mostly because of the mountain that exists uh, up here. Now I have 150 or so towers around town, but because of that mountain, I can't see over to this side of the valley. This side of the valley, I require a line of sight. So if I can't relay off something, I can't get to them because everything is blocked by this mound of dirt. The main reason that we were able to get up on this place was because of the HOA. This is a big master plan community. Well, the HOA isn't able to manage their maintenance and facilities without internet access. They have to be able to talk and send phones and everything so they can see what's going on. So without us, they can't get any way to talk to all their places without this site. So this enables the HOA community to maintain this uh, big community. So because we don't have power up here, we have to scrutinize every watt of power we use that we're harvesting from the sun and going into batteries. The parts of the system have been carefully selected for a myriad of reasons. First off is the amount of watts each thing use. So this switch here is a high temperature Cisco ruggedized industrial ethernet switch, which uses their standard operating system and can also run all the routing protocols I need that, to be able to switch clients with their static IPs and do the other functions that our clients need, like be able to do the packets for the phones and use our, all our private networks in it. It just looks different than every other switch everyone uses. And I've had this being able to tolerate heat up to 180 to 200 degrees even. Inside this box, it gets up to 160 degrees in the summertime. But if I ran a fan, a fan draws too many watts that I won't be able to get uh, cloud cover for. So that we have chosen every part in here uh, because of the amount of watts it draws. Everything up here has been carefully selected, even the solar panels. I didn't want little kids to be able to come up here and throw rocks at them and break them, so I used monocrystalline cells. The cells up here are 335 watts each. That's 1,335 watts total that I have to work with. 
The batteries have been carefully selected, being able to quickly recharge and have pretty high uh, discharge rates so that I can get pretty low on the batteries and still be able to charge them up. If I use typical uh, car batteries, they will go flat in no time because they typical car battery can't doesn't have a high discharge rate. The batteries we use are a uh, gel-based battery. There's also VRLA, absorbed gas mat, and lead acid. But in order to be up here, I don't want to come up here every week to add water to it, especially in Vegas. So we use gel batteries. They have a high temperature range, and inside the cabinet gets really hot because I don't have any fans. And they uh, enable us to go down and survive cloud cover, such as a shady day like today, for three days. At least that's what I calculated out to. So I've had a few of my guys always ask me, why don't we just use lithium cells? Those do everything. You can run them down almost nothing and still uh, be able to charge them hundreds of times. Well, the problem with lithium is they need a very specific temperature range. If you see your Tesla cars, they actually have a liquid cooling that goes between them. Getting any kind of pump or any kind of cooling up here, it would defeat the amount of uh, watts that I have. I'd have to have a, a system about five times the size and able to be able to cool these things to be able to use lithium. I just don't have that much space. If any of you know how to do it, write in in the comments that you've been able to get it working and tell me the parts, I'd love to use it. The brains of the system is a charge controller. I use the Morningstar charge controllers. It's this white thing in the back. And the reason I use this is because it's a uh, MPPT or a multiple point tracking system so that it acts as a DC to DC converter to keep these batteries for any voltage that comes in into the solar cells. The older type of charge controller is called a uh, PWM or pulse wave modulation. And that just takes a very specific voltage range and puts it into the batteries. So the main thing that this charge controller does is at certain types of the day, you're gonna get different types of voltages coming out of these panels. When there's cloud cover, you might only get like say uh, 50 watts or 50 uh, volts. Well, this is a 24 volt system. So this will actually convert it to what the batteries needs to charge, check how much the charge rate is on the batteries and either cut it off or convert the power and send more power into the batteries. As I was saying, everything's 24 volts. Well, these are 12 volt, 100 amp hour batteries. How do we get 24 volts? We wire them in series. When you wire in series, you're multiplying the, the, the voltages together. So two of these, two times 12 is 24 but I have four batteries. But if I put them in series and parallel in a certain wiring, I can get redundancy and I can get the 24 volts that my system requires. Everything in here has been carefully selected to be running at 24 volts so they don't have to do any DC to DC conversions. If I do DC to DC conversions, I get loss. The more loss I get, the less power I'm gonna be able to run, which equals either people running up here in emergency or alerts saying that our system's gonna about to go down. On top of this shade canopy, we've mounted our antennas. These antennas allow for our signal to come in, which is known as our backhaul, and distribute it out to clients. These radios here are uh, different types. The one right there that's a little circle, uh, that's, a, uh, that's one of our backhaul radios. That goes to a place about a half mile away that we can get a gigabit of speed. Uh, because of all the clients that we have up here. I need at least a gigabit of speed. Uh, these radios here allow us to carefully focus the signal. They're known as horn antennas. So these, each one of these holds 30 to 50 clients and they're able to, depending on their location, uh, relay up to this site. So the signal comes in from the client's house up to this and then goes out that little one on the top down to our relay then relays it across our network until it gets back to our data centers. The other thing about these radios are they're very low power. They take uh, GPS in so that they can sync with our network. Our whole network is timed by GPS so that we don't interfere with ourselves as we broadcast all over the valley. As I said, we had 150 at least uh, relay sites like this. And if you have them all broadcasting at different times that aren't correctly timed, you're gonna get them uh, constantly just overlapping. GPS solves this issue by only sending at certain times uh, dependent upon the signal that they get. Uh, this radio here, for instance, the backhaul that does a gig, it runs at 60 gigahertz, which is a very pointed beam, and, but it doesn't go far because of uh, oxygen absorption. But it'll do very fast speeds, up to a gig or two without much work. 
Now, this also has been carefully selected because it only uses six watts. Six watts I can deal with. Once we get over 100 watts, the system has to really be built out for a more robust system and we'd probably need a bigger shade canopy to put all the equipment to be able to do that. So, to calculate load averages, I have to know exactly how many transmitters we have, the switch is, how many uh, watts the switch is using, and how much any associated electronics, like the thing that actually pages up this, there's a problem. So this switch has been chosen because when I test it on my bench, it uses about 20 watts, which is one of the lowest in the industry. The uh, backhaul radio uses six watts. The other uh, client access radios will use about 10 watts. It's in, in its entirety, the system will use about 60 watts constant draw, which is the same as your light bulb that is always running. That uses about 60 watts. So this whole site uses about the same amount of power as a 60 watt light bulb. And we're able to serve 100 to 200 clients off of it. We do monitoring on the system constantly to be able to tell when to send someone out because there probably will come a few times of the year that someone will have to come up and charge it with a generator or some other device. Uh, the problem with the generator is it's only AC. So we have this device here that will actually convert to uh, AC to DC because everything in here is DC. Batteries only run on DC. So that if there's an emergency, you take up a generator, power it on, charge up the batteries, and then we have a few more days that it can last. The uh, way that it monitors it is there's leads that go off of the batteries and into this thing that injects power. The PoE injector is what actually powers everything. It has a web interface and I can pull all the stats over how the batteries are doing based upon voltage. A 12 volt battery is actually 50% dead when you see it at 12.25 uh, volts. Once it gets much less than that, you want it to really cut off because you'll damage the batteries once you get too much of a discharge. So what this system does is our network operations center is constantly pulling what the voltage is on this device. If it sees uh, less than 12.25 volts, I have about six hours to get up here and do something about it. Our network operations center will dispatch either our electricians or someone else, depending on what they see is wrong. They'll come up here and hook up a generator to refill the batteries or replace the batteries if they aren't holding anymore. I could also do this off the charge controller. It also has a web interface, but for me, I monitor all our sites voltage off this so I can easily tell and our facilities are all uh, set up to monitor the uh, PoE injectors. With all the gotchas and all the small details that you have to take into account to get this thing working, you would think there'd be a lot of downtime. But honestly, I pulled a report right before I came here. This thing hasn't been down for years, uh, which I can't say with other parts of the grid. When I deal with uh, other parts of the grid, it's going out all the time and sometimes the batteries don't hold that long or they're uh, not working as well as I was hoping. Uh, the main thing to do when you're doing a solar site though, you have to plan for exactly as much power as you want to be able to draw. If I added another 200 customers, this definitely would not support it. If I added a different type of radio that would give me more speed, like a 10 gig radio, this site wouldn't support it. So if I really wanted to change the system, I would have to have thicker cables, I'd have to have more solar panels, I'd have to have bigger batteries, and everything would have to be recalculated in order to do different types of things. So when you start these things, know exactly what you're trying to accomplish and just don't wing it.